This is the podcast for Narrate Church. Narrate Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. at the Grand Street Theater in Helena, Montana. For more information, visit www.narratechurch.org. Well, hi. Good morning. This is really uh, it's kind of surreal to be here because I'm trying to think of the last time. I was on this stage back in August um, with the, the worship team. Before that, it had been a couple times in high school when I um, was always doing like I was never like a, a, a lead guy, but I was always like salesman number three or something like that. <laughs> but uh, a lot of memories of this stage. And then uh, another, th- another thing that was kind of cool that happened um, about, f- oh, let's, let's, let's pray first. I just want to pray before I kind of go off here because I don't know where that's going to go. But uh, Lord, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for uh, just the trust that uh, Adam and the folks here just have uh, in me the just to speak and share, uh, hopefully, your words today. We just ask you to bless our hearts, our minds, and be open to uh, what you have to say now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, that was, um, oh, no. okay, I'll tell you the story, I'll tell you the story. Uh, so when Chris was playing this, this Hallelujah song that I'd written a couple years ago, and it's, it's always kind of surreal to hear someone else sing your songs, but one of the other times that happened was out here, um, about 14 years ago, my wife and I um, were trying to figure out, you know, where our, what we're going to do with our lives, you know? And um, I'd, I'd been doing a lot of guitar lessons, and I've been doing a lot of um, working down at Rose's Cantina, if you ever remember Rose's downtown. And, uh, and I, d- I didn't really want to be waiting uh, tables much longer, and I'd, we'd really prayed, God, you know, I, I just want to kind of pursue music and, and ministry and, and see where that goes. And so I really felt like this would be a good time to do it. And so I handed in my two weeks notice down at Rose's Cantina, and then uh, the very next morning I got a call from, from Mary Ann here at Grand Street, and she said, we've been talking about doing a, um, a Christmas play for kids. Would you, would you be interested in writing music, you know, like t- basically 10 songs to do a Hansel and Gretel was the, the Christmas thing. And this was like in July. And so, um, so that, I was, I was like, yeah, absolutely. I was like, the timing of God on this was so perfect, you know. And so uh, that's what I did in, like, July and August, and, and we, I got, um, I think I got, like, I'm not sure, I think it was, like, $2,000 or, or something like that, but at the time, it was totally enough money just to provide for the next two months of, of work, you know? And then so I just had a profound kind of memory today, sitting there um, thinking about um, being here at Grand Street when, uh, when God provided, like, just in that, that perfect timing, and uh, since then, it's been a wild ride, just kind of letting God provide and, and trying to learn how to cooperate in that. So it's a, this place is kind of, kind of a special place to me in, in those, for those, those reasons, I guess. But um, so this morning, I, I wanted to talk with you guys a little bit about something just kind of dear to my heart, um, and that's worship leading. I mean, I, I, I spent many years um, kind of leading worship, you know, much like, much like this. And, and uh, I was talking with Adam when we had lunch together a couple months ago, um, just what an what an amazing opportunity you guys have each and every time you gather, you know. What's the, what's the whole singing thing about? Why, why, do you, why would people come together here rather than be out camping on a Sunday? Why would you be here singing songs to God together? I mean, what's the, what's the value of that? And so I kind of just wanted to just talk a little bit about my experience in that. So, but first of all, we're going to start off with a little, uh, by way of introduction, um, a little game here. So uh, this is... Oh, this is a teaser for what's next. Anyone know what this is, by the way? This is actually a... Someone could possibly know what this is by this photo. Hymnal? Well, no, but that's a good guess. It could be. No? It's a book. What book would it be? What book would it be? Uh, Bible, maybe? I don't know. The Bible, is a good, you know, Jesus or the Bible is always a good answer in this kind of context. So just, just throw it out there. You're, even if you're wrong, there's still a good offer. So, um, okay, so we're going to play a little game here uh, called uh, What's Missing? And this is, uh, I'm going to introduce you to one of our many wonderful children. So uh, round one, crayons. You can play along if more you are right now. All right, let's go ahead and let's... Uh, Okay, so this is Quinn. This is uh, my boy Quinn. We, uh, Dieter and I have, have six children, and Quinn is number five. 
And uh, so this is Quinn. Okay, so here's the deal. You're going to try to guess what's missing. I'm going to show you up some, uh, some crayons here. All right, go ahead. All right, here's your crayons. Memorize the crayons. And on the next slide, we're going to take one of them away, and I want you to, to guess what's missing. All right? Ready? You got it? All right, go. What's missing? Brown. Brown. Excellent. Fantastic. Okay. Good job. Round one is worth one point. Okay. You're, you're still in it. Okay. So round, round two. Okay. Oh, yeah. There we go. The, uh, the, the slide shot. Okay. Uh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Round two. Round two. Junk, junk drawer. This is not our real junk drawer. Our real junk drawer is terrifying. So this is kind of the, uh, like for the purposes of this, our junk drawer. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we have, here's the different items. Sundry sorted items there. And then uh, we'll take one away. All right. Ooh, pocket knife. Let's have a look. Show me pocket knife. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So far, so good. All right. What's missing? This is the theme. Okay. We're going to come back to this. I'm setting the table for the discussion. Okay. Round three, books. Many books that you may have from your household displayed on our, kitchen, our living room floor. Oh, boy. There's some classics there. All right. Then we'll take one away. Ready? You're still playing along, right? What? The, the giving tree. That's right. Ooh. No, Lady and the Tramp is... I don't know. Was it still there? Yeah. It's, it's, all right. The giving tree. Classic. <laughs> By the way, there is another shirt. If I wear another shirt, I look exactly like Shel Silverstein, I was told. So <laughs> if my beard is a little bit longer, it's... That was devastating when someone told me that. <laughs> okay, uh, round four, probably my favorite round of all time. It's worth uh, eight points. Okay. Uh, round four, Star Wars characters. We're going to get a quick uh, review of our Star Wars characters here, I think. The setup, okay. We have Max Rebo, Bosk, Tan Solo, R2, second row, Greedo, uh, the Stormtrooper, Luke, Jar Jar Binks. Uh, <laughs> A Jawa, Imperial Guard, Darth Vader, and kind of is like semi-formal attire or something. And then <laughs> Emperor Palpatine. Okay. So we'll take one away. R2-D2. Exactly, exactly. Okay. <laughs> He's such a ham. It's hilarious. Okay, so here's... Back to what this thing is. It's a Bible, right? Okay, it's a Bible. All right, let's... let's uh, this is Jefferson's Bible. And I've, how many of you guys have, have seen Jefferson's Bible? I guess it's at the Smithsonian. Is it still on display out there, kind of permanent, semi-permanent display? Jefferson's Bible is kind of fascinating. Um, let's go ahead and... Oh, there it is. That's actually my Bible. But we, didn't, we couldn't get the real one for this photo shoot. So, yeah, uh, let's, let's look at this for a second. Jefferson's Bible... Jefferson was a, was a deist, you know? I mean, he didn't really believe in God's daily intimate involvement in, in our lives. And so Jefferson uh, took, took a razor to his Bible, and he just kind of began editing. There was something specifically in the Bible. You can see some of these things are kind of uh, taken out. There's certain segments of this Bible that, that Jefferson just so bothered Jefferson that he, um, he, he would just rather just not have them there in the Bible. I don't know if you have any stuff like that in your Bible where you're just like, I don't even know how to process this. So he would take out entire verses or, or fragments, probably in some cases chapters or so, of, of things were just gone from his Bible. Any idea what that, what that would be? What's that? Miracles. Miracles? That's a good one. Let's, let's have a look here. Yeah. yeah I, I couldn't you know, make miracles. So, but yeah, but basically, yeah, it's, it's all, the, all the miracles, all the healings, all the supernatural stuff, like the real-time miracles of Jesus just perplexed Jefferson entirely. And so he was, I guess maybe to his credit, I don't know, I mean, like he at least had the, the honesty to, to just like wrestle with it in, <laughs> to such a way where it caused him to pick up, you know, uh, his Bible and like go through it, like with some sincerity. I don't know, I mean, he, I think he's missing out on something, and that's a different discussion. But, all right, so that, uh, that brings us to the what's missing uh, theme for the day. Um, Jesus the healer. Uh, if you were to take, say, a, a first century Jew, someone who, um, like Rumpelstiltskin style, kind of uh, fell asleep 
right around the time of, of the birth of the church, um, the resurrection, all this kind of stuff. And, and then they were to be like Rumpelstiltskin, and they were just kind of like to awake today, right now. And, they, and you, were to, you were to show them somehow the entire world in a glance and say, all right, what's missing? What's, what's missing from the, you know, the whole earth? I'm just going to show you the whole earth, first century Rumpelstiltskin Jewish person. What, th- there's something, I think they would probably get this one pretty quickly. What, what is it that's just missing from, from that mindset of the very beginnings of Jesus' ministry? What is, it that, what is it that's just, I'd say, noticeably absent? Any ideas? I don't know. I think, I think, they, would, I think they would probably say uh, the temple. The, 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 the third temple. So for the Jewish person, the temple for a thousand years leading up to Jesus' time, the temple was the most important structure. You can't really overemphasize politically, economically, certainly in a religious life. That was the thing that just affected their whole life. And then it, I don't know much about history. Really. I mean, truly I don't. But it was in like 70 uh, AD that, that the temple was destroyed, the second temple. And since then, there's been no um, recreation of that temple. And there's a, there's a lot of different discussions on why that is and whether it'll happen and all that kind of stuff. The point is, well, there's no temple right now. And the, here's the punchline of the whole morning, I'll just tell you right now. If you, if you have to go right now, this is what I want you to hear. That, that we are the temple. You know, We are, in a very real way, the, the missing temple. And that first century Jew uh, could maybe be persuaded that, oh yeah, somehow... You know, Paul's writings, you know, and Jesus' teachings that we are the new temple. So there's just five things I wanted to connect to our Sunday morning experience of worshiping God and just kind of overlay this idea that we are truly the temple. So there's five things about the temple. Uh, There's probably, there's books and books written on this, and you could probably go to lots of different um, dimensions of what the temple is. But uh, temple has five, kind of five aspects to it. First of all, it was the place on earth where God's presence dwelled, okay? So we think about our experience here this morning, and we come to gather, and God's presence is here. But for the first century Jew, it was like the omniscient, um, omnipresent God of the universe who, uh, yes, was dwelled in some way in every living and non-living thing, uh, uniquely dwelled in the Holy of Holies, the center of of this temple, right? So as Christians, yeah, we, we believe that God is present in every, every aspect of, of the created universe, but, that's, but we would never say that God is every created thing. We'd never say, oh, God for me is the, the stream, or God for me is the rock, or God for me is the, the cup of coffee, or whatever. Like, I mean, pantheism says that. Pantheism says that God is everything, right? But a Christian believes that God is, while present in all things in some way, is distinct from created things, right? Okay, so that's, that's the first thing about the temple. This is a place of God's special, unique, abiding presence. So we believe that when, if we're the temple of God, that somehow when we come together, separate from being off by ourselves and having the Lord dwell in us, there's something distinct and something unique about us being uh, together and God's presence is uniquely here in some way. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that's pretty awesome. Um, second thing is it's the place of instruction. The temple for the, the, the Jews was the, the original Ten Commandments rested in that, in that Holy of Holies, in the, the center of that temple. So this is a place of, of instruction. I mean, kind of like coming together here, um, hearing, you know, hearing Adam speak or, uh, or through the, the teachings of the songs or all this stuff. It's like a place of instruction, right? So worship, we come together and we get the place of instruction, all right? So that's, uh, that's the first two things, and, and either of those things we could talk about for a long period of time, but I wanted to talk about this third one a little bit because this is one that, um, as, as like a worship leader, um, I get, um, I don't know, being, being a worship leader, being on the worship team, there's kind of a lot of, I don't know, when you start to think about it, there's a lot of responsibility you know, that goes into leading the worship of 
of people. And, uh, and you guys, uh, it, was, it was a beautiful day to hear you guys sing and play this morning. You guys are awesome worship team. And it was, it was really, it was pretty awesome to hear you sing that song, so thanks. Um, but I think a worship leader is actually a bit of a, a misnomer because really what worship is, you know, worship is the, um, the ordering of your life around one thing. I mean, it's not, uh, it's, it's like, what, what do you live for? What is your, uh, Paul Tillich, the theologian, said, it's what's, the, what's your ultimate concern? So worship is ordering your entire life around one thing. Uh, Kierkegaard said, a saint is a person whose life is about one thing. I, I, I love that idea. A saint is a person whose life is about one thing. And so uh, for us, we, we can't really, through singing four songs or so, it, it's impossible to uh, re- fully worship entirely. You know, like that's what that really, what we're really doing as, as, as worship leaders, you know, mm-hmm. is really more just giving a chance to give praise. And music is like, um, I marvel at this as, as, a, as a musician, that, like how music unlocks such... Uh, mm-hmm. Such power and expressive beauty, you know? I mean, you, it, you can manipulate people with music pretty easily. I mean, you can kind of turn it, turn it down and, and ratchet it up or, or, or bring people on like an emotional roller coaster. So I think that's probably what, part of what the worship leading uh, thing is that people get. Um, you can kind of get carried away in it, you know? I remember I was um, a sophomore, I think, at, at Helena High, and uh, I had just got my... My first synthesizer, it was a Casio CZ1, and it was a pretty awesome, glorious synthesizer machine. This was 1988, maybe, something like that. And uh, mm-hmm. I was looking for a summer job, and uh, I thought, ba- ballpark you know, organist, the Helena Brewers, they, they don't have a, a ballpark organist. So, so I, grabbed, uh, I grabbed my synthesizer, and I, I went down to the ballpark, and I met... Uh, the general manager, his name is Gene uh, Megan, and uh, I said, hey, my name's David. I, have you guys considered having like a ballpark organist? And he's like, I don't know. Uh, what do you mean? Like, okay. yeah, he said, yeah, you know, the whole do, 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 you know, and all the, all the kind of stuff. And he's like, sure, yeah, we'll give it a try. And so he gave me like, uh, like you know, free hamburger and, and uh, Bob. <laughs> No, and he gave me 25 bucks and uh, a game, and, and so I got to haul my equipment up, up to the press box every, uh, every home game and sit up there next to the, the callers and uh, the KBLL announcer, Kevin Butler, and then the visiting out-of-town uh, announcers for the games and sit up there and kind of uh, play along, you know, with the game. Um, and it was, it was a blast, but I, I realized that you very much can, like, work a crowd almost, even as from a ballpark organist standpoint, you know, there was one time where uh, there was like, t- you know, the bottom of the, the ninth and, the, and the, the winning run was on third mm-hmm. and uh, all we needed was to get, a, you know, a, a single to, to bring this guy in or something like that and the, he laid down a nice bunt down third base line, the third baseman came up and threw it across the diamond and the, the runner clearly, you know, beat out the throw, but the ump, you know, just called him out and everyone was just riotous, you know, and uh, it was great, and I just love that, and, uh, and then so I played, uh, I played a Three Blind Mice, like little nursery rhyme, Three Blind Mice, <laughs> I didn't even think about it, but I just thought it was so funny, and, uh, and then so the umpire uh, called out the, you know, the, the manager from the, you know, the dugout, and they just, they really were, and they were gesturing up, you know, at me, like, the whole time, I was like, oh, man, so I, I got, so I got a handwritten note, like, very quickly after that, that I was no longer allowed to play. Three blind mice at, uh, at my discretion. So, but I was like, "Aha! Music is a powerful thing, you know. This is good. I need to stay on this and practice my my music." But uh, I don't know why that's. I'm talking about that. Um, I'm talking about it because because praise. Okay, so praise praise is just simply recognizing the good uh, the good in something. Um, Psalm ninety five. Uh, Kind of for my personal devotion, I, I, I pray Psalm 95 um, pretty much every morning. Um, this goes back to our, 
our first, uh, our first idea of, like, why are we even here? Why do we gather and sing to the Lord? Um, here's, here's how Psalm 95 begins. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Um, there it is, and it, and it says in the next verse that, uh, that we should bring songs of praise and thanksgiving. It says, let us sing joyful songs of praise and thanksgiving. So it's like, I, t- I take, like when, if I step up to the microphone on a Sunday morning, and I don't just really, I don't know, if you, Chris, have you ever had that where you're just like, I'm not really feeling it today? So uh, here we go. It's, and you're like, sometimes you even go, why do we even do this? Why don't we just, you know, is it, is it God's idea or not that we start off with song? Well, I've, the scriptures have a lot to say about that, and they encourage us continually to be singing together. So I just wanted to say that for anyone who, who doubts the, uh, the, the format of coming together and singing, that singing is powerful, uh, but it's God's ordained, it's God's properly ordained way of bringing himself a praise. Um, and I think there's kind of a, this cool phrase about uh, offering Jesus a sacrifice of praise. So, um, and I was thinking about this. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So praise um, is, just a, is, part of, is a part of worship. We're not really saying that uh, in praising God, we're, it, we've necessarily ordered our entire lives around him already. I mean, we can acknowledge the good of God, but it, uh, we haven't yet fully ordered our entire lives around. We just, we're just acknowledging the good of God. But um, shoot, shoot that verse up there again from Hebrews. Um, a sacrifice of praise. Okay, the temple was a place of sacrifice, right? Primarily, it was a place where... Uh, it was the only place on earth where the Jews would bring animal offerings or other offerings and actually sacrifice stuff. And it was a big, bloody, like, smelly mess. I mean, they, they say, I mean, if you use your imagination, it doesn't take much to imagine, like, the whole Jewish, uh, the whole area surrounding Jerusalem when the temple sacrifices were being offered. You could, you could smell it. I mean, it was, a, it was a fragrant, there was a cloud, and it wasn't necessarily fragrant like May, you know, in Helena, but like, it was, there was something to behold there. It was a, a sacrifice, was, um, was a big, nasty ordeal. And so how does that relate to what we do here on a Sunday morning? Is there any sacrifice uh, going on? Well, there's, there's two sacrifices. One is the, the sacrifice of Jesus, who we, we praise, and so many of these songs talked about the, the victory of that sacrifice. But also for us, and here's what I wanted to kind of catch as like, okay, we're the temple. How does sacrifice have anything to do with us? If we are the temple and, uh, and we're praising God, we're giving him, we're saying, you are the Lord, that necessarily means that we are not, right? That necessarily means that if we're giving God the glory, if we're saying, God, uh, my family, you know, they're in your hands. God, my work, my mortgage, my, my, my plans for myself, they're in your hands, Lord. If we're, if we're really doing that as we remember and as we sing uh, the words of these songs, then that's got to hurt actually a little bit if we're being honest with it. And if we're just mentally going, oh, yes, you are, Lord, you are great. That might not hurt as much. But when we're really offering a sacrifice of praise, you know, when we're really saying, you are, Lord, I am not, you have a plan for my life, it's, uh, and my plan is, is subservient to that. That's got to hurt a little bit. You know what I mean? That's, I think that's where the sacrifice uh, comes in. All right. Um, oh, another cool thing about the temple, just like a little detail was, uh, the, mount, the mountain that uh, the temple is built on uh, in, in Jerusalem um, was actually the, the historically most biblical scholars think that agree that that's the exact same place where Abraham uh, sacrificed or would have sacrificed Isaac. Kind of a cool, cool little connection there. All the way under cool stuff about the Bible. All right, uh, cleansing. And here, so here's kind of the last, the last big part of the the five key points about the the Bible, the temple, God's presence. Okay, place of instruction. 
place of praise, place of sacrifice, sacrifice of praise. And then it's a place of uh, cleansing, right? So um, thinking about worship and why does God, like, why does God command us to worship himself? Uh, does, does he need the attention? You know, is there some kind of, do we add anything to his, his glory by that? Is he kind of like hoarding up all of this, this praise and worship? No, no, I don't think so. I mean, it has to do with being, for us, you know, the, the worship of God benefits not God, but us. Augustine, Augustine said that. that. The worship of God is, is for our benefit because God is the greatest good. God knows that there's nothing better out there. You know, if, if God knew of something better than himself, he would tell us about that, you know? He would say, oh, you should go worship this thing, right? That's, that's not the case, right? God knows that he is the greatest good that there is for us. And so, purely for our benefit, out of love, God is calling us to worship him. So that's, that's I think, this Beatitudes um, notion here. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. That's, that's what that's saying. That's saying that, that if we know for ourselves, if we, we come to God, focus completely on him, he's our area of, our primary area of concern, that we will see God. We'll be happy. As opposed to, as opposed to the, the other part of that, that those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, they will be satisfied, right? If you, if you hunger and thirst for anything else, you're going to continue to be kind of frustrated. So part of the, part of the cleansing part of the, of the worship is what is it that's our, what is it that we worship? I mean, is it, is it God or is it many other things? You know, I mean, it's, it's the usual things. You know, it's, it's, it's power, it's uh, success, it's, it's money, it's health, it's inordinate preoccupation with uh, pleasures. It's, this, it's the usual suspects, right? It's, it's all those things that keep us from being like God. But God wants us to worship him because we become like what we worship. It's, it's like spiritual physics, you know? Whatever it is, we order our lives around. A, a saint is a person whose life is about one thing, right? And so whatever it is, we just order our lives around entirely. Um, we become like that. If we become obsessed with anything that's not God, it's, uh, it's, it's a far distant cry to what, what God has for us. So um, the last thing I, w- I wanted to show you was this, this story here from, uh, from John. And this is the story of Jesus cleansing the temple. And uh, this speaks just a little bit about, um, about us. Picture us, if we're the, if we're the temple, um, what this means to us. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area. Just pause here for a second. Um, I think, <laughs> boy, this, this line about he made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area, that's, that's fascinating to me because it doesn't, it doesn't say, if it said he just got one, like reached over and grabbed one, <laughs> uh, like that almost makes sense. But you like, I don't know, how much... How much time does it take to fashion a whip out of cords? And you have to, like, kind of sit. And, I mean, he's just kind of lacing this thing, this kind of... And, I, and don't get me wrong. I don't think he's, like, in a fit of, like, like he's out of control. But I'm just saying, he, he was thinking about this, you know? And so God's anger, God's anger, whenever you encounter God's anger in the Bible, it's useful for me to think of it. It's like God's anger is his passion to set things right, you know? I mean, as a father... If I get angry uh, in the right situation, like defending my, my kids, you know, from a bully or defending my daughter from a, you know, a boyfriend or whatever, right? If I'm angry in, a, in, the, in the best possible sense, I'm just trying to set things right. I'm passionate to set things right. So that's what Jesus is doing here. He's passionately setting something right in the temple area, okay? So 
with the sheep and the oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, these were, these were animals of sacrifice, take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. He's saying Jesus came expecting. He came to the temple. He came to the temple expecting a place of prayer and worship, and he found something less than that. He found people uh, who, who had kind of cashed in and were worshiping something less. They are ordering their lives around something less than that. And so uh, Jesus isn't going to, I mean, he's not going to just go, okay, whatever, fine with you guys. He, 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 takes, he takes this seriously, that we order our lives around nothing less than the one thing uh, we were made for. Uh, and here's the, here's the rest of the, the scripture. His disciples recalled the words of scripture. Now, I almost, like this almost reminds, this, this could be like a total aside in like a, a Mel Brooks line or like a Woody Allen line. Like Peter would have like, did we not say the zeal for your house will consume me or something like that. I mean, like, it's like <laughs> I, just perfectly understated. Like, yeah. He's a little zealous for the house of God. At this, the Jews answers and said to him, what sign can you show for doing this? Okay, here we go. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said this temple had been under construction. It was under reconstruction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But the punchline of the whole thing, the reason we're here this morning, he says, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. And Paul, in Corinthians Uh, further elaborates that we are all uh, the temple of his body, that we are dwelling places of the Lord Most High. So um, I think what I want to do is I just want to kind of close with just a couple questions for us. We can skip over the the next couple slides. Um, But the five aspects of the temple, the the five things that I just kind of want us to think about here this morning is that we are... um, a place of God's presence dwelling among us, that we are a place of God's instruction, both, both from the microphone and both from the stories of people's lives, both from the scriptures. Um, and we're also a, a place where praise, where we're supposed to recognize the good of God. And, and that, that comes in the form of music, uh, but it comes also in just recognizing the good of God in our lives. And then sacrificing, cleansing. So the, my question is, um, what of the what of those five areas is what's missing? You know, from our lives, we are nothing's missing from the earth. I mean, uh, the temple is here. You know, this is this is us. But what's what's missing from our lives? Do we need uh, do we need to be people who reflect more on God's presence in our lives? Do we need to be just thirsting for that instruction of God? Do we need to be uh, in that place of offering sacrifice of praise? Do we need to be a place of, uh, um, of inviting others to that? Because the, the Israelites um, in Isaiah, Isaiah said that the whole, all the nations of the Lord would be streaming towards God. So that was the point. The point of the temple, right, was not for itself. The point of this is the mission, the scattering of that. The scattering here is that we need to be a, t- a temple, a city on a hill, right? The, the temple that all nations would stream towards it. My, uh, my other son, our other son, Asher, is um, nine years old, and he asked his papa, his, his um, non- non-believing papa, agnostic, my, my father-in-law, is a great man, um, but Asher knows that he, he, that he has no relationship with God. And so we asked him the other day, he said, Papa, at what point in your life did you become separated from God? I was like, when, I, when, when they both told me this independently that this conversation had happened, I was, I was amazed at, um, at Asher's, not just his courage to ask that question, but his way of phrasing it, that his, he assumed that there was a relationship with God uh, that had gone, gone astray, and the premise there is beautiful, but that he invited him back. You know, he was saying, what happened with that, you know? <laughs> Putting that in his court, saying, 
Well, you need to make an explanation for that because we want, we want you in. You know, we want you to be streaming towards that temple. So today, as you guys go out, um, realize that's part of the mission of the temple is, to, is that all nations would stream back towards it. It's not unto ourselves. It's not like just for us that this fun little party happens, but it's, it's, it's unto the whole world. For more information on Narrate Church, visit www.narratechurch.org or download the mobile app now available for iPhone and Android.